what can be a win for the independence of the spirit of mutuality and cooperation, the proposed sale of LV, formerly known as Liverpool Victoria Friendly Society Limited, and one of the leading mutual insurers in the UK today, to the US-based multi-asset alternative investment firm Bain Capital, was thwarted by the members and policyholders of LV on 10th December 2021. Founded in 1843 as a mutual offering penny policies to give poorer families in Liverpool the chance to bury their dead with dignity, LV is owned today by its 1.2 million members. In 2021, LV asked its members to cast their votes in advance by proxy either online or by post and decide on the future of the business, in particular to approve the acquisition of the LV business by Bain Capital and secondly, a scheme of arrangement to complete the transaction of the sale. Out of nearly 175,000 members voting, which is less than 15% of the total membership of LV, 31% voted against and 69% in favour of the sale. A 75% votes threshold was needed for the sale to go through. While informing the results of the vote and its implications, the website of LV reports that the mutual was still seeking investment to remain competitive and to grow over the long term. It adds that the LV board had listened to the member concerns about the loss of mutuality and will in particular explore whether mutuality can be retained either on a standalone basis without undue risk to members or through a merger with a larger mutual organization. LV is currently at an early stage of exploring possible merger with Royal London a bigger mutual insurer in the UK. On 16 December 2021, the Cooperative News UK reported MPs in Westminster Hall debating on the role of co-ops and mutual sector included a special discussion on the LV and politicians from all sides had been critical of the handling of the deal despite the compelling case the management had made for the deal. While recognizing the threat of demutualization and at the same time acknowledging the rare display of LV members' powers, and right to choose in the instant case, some MPs did wonder if only time will be the judge of the decision to block the sale. As the world keenly watches the soon to be unfolding next chapter of the story, Ms. Anne Apps, lecturer at University of Newcastle Law School and member of the ICA Cooperative Law Committee, speaks to Mr. Peter Hunt, former General Secretary of the Cooperative Party UK and currently the managing partner of Mutuo, a UK-based consulting firm for mutuals and cooperatives, about the details of the story so far, what lies ahead, and the impact it might have on the mutual and cooperative sector internationally, where on one hand, the movement is discussing its basic values and principles with the aim to deepen their practice, and on the other, capital continues to be a conundrum for cooperatives and mutuals. Mr. Hunt is also the co-founder of Supporters Direct, which went on to establish over 100 supporters trusts at professional football clubs. In 2018 and 2019, he led the successful industry alliance to develop the Australian Treasury Laws Amendment Mutual Reforms Act 2019, the first renewal of Australian mutuals legislation for 20 years. Okay, so good morning and hello, Peter. Uh, I should say good evening to you. So I'm in Australia and, and Peter is in the UK. Thanks so much for agreeing to this interview. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation very, very much. But before we deep dive into the world of co-ops and mutuals, I was hoping that you'd give me a little bit of uh, a background about yourself. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in uh, the movement, I suppose, the co-op movement, the mutual movement, just uh, in the UK, but also internationally, because I know you from the work that you've done in Australia. Well, that, hi, Anne, and uh, good morning to you. And um, thank you very much for uh, getting up um, to, to talk to me. Um, I guess um, my uh, story with the cooperative sector starts in my childhood when both my parents at some time or other um, worked for Leicester Co-op in, in England. Um, so I guess it was uh, always in my blood, you know, it was a sort of part of the an institution in, in my community and um, something that had always been um, part of my family. Um, and so um, I went to university, studied, um, and I'd never really thought about working in the cooperative sector, but I wanted to work in politics. And so um, the short version of the story is that I got um, a job working for the cooperative party. I was the um, party's administrative officer back in 1994. Wow. And uh, it was a very exciting time because um, 
politics was changing in the UK at the time. And, you know, we were just going through a boost. The Cooperative Party, for those who don't know, um, is connected to the Labour Party in the UK. So it's a social democratic party. Um, it's been going since 1918 um, and uh, stands joint candidates with the Labour Party. And at that time, um, there was a new leader of the Labour Party, Tony Blair, um, people will have heard of. And uh, uh, there was great hope that he was going to win the election. And he did that in 1997. And by by that time, um, I was working, um, I changed jobs in, in, in the co-op party and I was working as a, a regional organiser. And um, I got lucky, I guess, in 1998 when I'm very young for, for, for the job. I was only 31, but I got the job of general secretary. Um, and I, I didn't realise it at the time, but I was, I was um, probably in the best place at the best time for any general secretary of the Cooperative Party. We, we had then followed with a good um, 10 years or more of, um, of, uh, of being in partnership in government, uh, which gave us a great opportunity to um, uh, press the case for co-ops, um, press the case for all types of mutual organisations and do that um uh with government ministers you know with people that were friends and prepared to listen to us um it was clear though at the time that we couldn't do that all on our own and we wanted to work more broadly with the wider mutual sector and so um we established mutuo 20 years ago now 20 years ago last month in fact um and the idea behind Mutual was to do the same work as the cooperative party, but to do it across all types of cooperatives and mutuals and to work with um, all different political parties, because we did have supporters in different traditions. Um, there were um, social Democrats, as I've said, but there were also conservatives who, from the Christian democratic tradition, who were very supportive of uh, co-ops. Um, there were um, liberals, you know, from all for people from all different wings of the political spectrum. And so Mutual was established to be able to um, try to do the same kind of work, which was to improve the business environment for Co-ops and Mutuals, but do that on the basis of uh, working with everybody who was interested in that. Um, and so, you know, we concentrated on legislation, on regulation and on policy um, uh, on this cross-party basis. Um, since about 2012, um, pretty much at the same time as the Quebec summits. And if you're around to remember those, you know, I'm, I sound, sound like an old man now, you know, bringing up something over 10 years ago. But I mean, the summits were um, a, a focus for lots of uh, new approaches to working together. And so we decided um, because we had so many issues in common in, in different countries that we would provide our services internationally at the time. Uh, so for me personally, I carried on doing all of that until 2008 um, when I stepped away from my cooperative party role and I became full time exclusively working with Mutual. Oh, wow. I, I, there's so much background in there that, that uh, reveals so much for me. Uh, I learned a lot from, from uh, just your explanation there about uh, the work that I've known that you've done in Australia and it makes so much more sense now. So. Thank you so much for that. And it's a beautiful segue into the next question, which is we've been talking about mutuals and we've been talking about co-ops. We've sort of thrown them together in the same mix and you've explained a little bit how the two sectors have sort of come to work together through, through uh, your organisations in the UK. A lot of people don't really understand what they are and what the difference between them is. So if we start from the basic premise that a mutual and a co-op, they're both member-owned businesses. How would you explain to the audience the difference between the two? And it's interesting to think about the political difference between the two, I, I think, as well. Sure. Um, I mean, let's say uh, member-owned member, member -owned organisations is as good a definition as any, mm. uh, good, as good a description as any. But, I mean, one of the things that is a little bit of a hobby horse of mine is that we get a bit hung up in, the, in, the se in our sector about different um, ownership structures. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're talking about legal um, forms in many respects, um, but when we use the term, in the UK anyway, when we use the term mutual, we're talking about 
all types of member-owned businesses. And so in a sense, it's a generic term. Um, it's also a specific term, which is where the thing gets complicated then. And when you start to talk about the difference between cooperatives and mutuals, well, a cooperative is, is a business that um, is established as a member-owned business, but actually adheres to the cooperative principles. And so in most countries, it's a specific legal thing um, to be a co-op. Um, so all co-ops are mutuals, but not all mutuals are co-ops. Um, and um, I don't think we should really get too hung up on legal entities because what we're actually talking about is a different strand of the economy. Um, businesses that do things for a different reason. Um, they've got different motives, one of service delivery rather than that of capital accumulation. So co-ops and mutuals are the same in this very important respect is that they exist to bring people together to be able to solve uh, problems that they might have to provide a service that they want, but to do it focused on that service rather than on building capital value, which is the reason that um, companies are established. So for me, it's cooperative business with a small c. Um, and that's what we mean by by all of this. And, and you know, I sometimes get a bit impatient with you know, other labels that, that people bring to bring to the table around social enterprise or um, solidarity economy and all that sort of stuff. You know, I understand it and I can see that it's 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 correct, but it's overcomplicating it because the answer stares us in the face. You know, we're talking about the cooperative economy. It's a small C and we should all be proud of that. So from 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 my perspective, there are legal differences in some countries um, there are specific things which are cooperative enterprises, but when we're talking about a cooperative movement, it's a small C, and it should include all those different types of member-owned businesses, in my opinion. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I think that um, this identity thing is really interesting and it's really topical because we've just come out of the ICA Congress and essentially for, for most of 2022, there's going to be a lot of discussion around what is the identity uh, of a cooperative. And you, you're right, we have this distinction between legal models and we also have the movement. But I think it, that your contribution there is incredibly valuable because if we don't start to sort of find that point of difference and zoom in on that point of difference, then it makes it very, very difficult to make a case um, for, for what co-ops are and why they should be treated differently. Or should they be treated the same, but they are but they have different characteristics. So, But that's right. But at the time when everybody's talking about what's the purpose of business, what's the purpose of corporations, you know, we do have a different purpose and we do have a distinct purpose. And that to me is the, you know, that business purpose is the identity. It's the core of it rather than a specific legal structure. Uh, and we can have those legal structures for very good reasons. Um, but when we're trying to, uh, communicate what's good about cooperative businesses. It's it's what they achieve that matters, not how they do it. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about demutualisation, uh, particularly in relation to the uh, the to LV, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, the co-op sector tends to see demutualisation of any co-op or mutual as a loss or defeat in what is essentially a war. Uh, to maintain those business models as distinct from, from the investor-owned model. So I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about this. What We use the word demutualisation, but again, I don't know that our audience know what we're talking about when we say demutualisation. Um, I think we assume that people know. Um, so I was wondering if you could explain that a little bit, but also if you could give some examples of any demutualisations that have happened in the past in, in your time uh, in the sector that you would consider to be such a tragedy in the sense that that an organisation that was benefiting many has been demutualised and uh, potentially e exploited or whatever has happened, it has never delivered the same benefit or it has ultimately disappeared. So I just wondered if you had any examples. Yeah, well, uh, all of them. Or many. <laughs> right. Well, look, I mean, let, let's, let's start at the beginning. I mean, Strictly speaking, demutualization is the loss of mutual status. And, you know, going back to what I've already said about the different types of co-ops and mutuals, whatever the way they're organized, if you 
take that status away um, and they're no longer owned by their members, then you can say they've been demutualized because it's the member ownership, which is the mutual part of the core of the business. So that usually in practical terms means they've been converted into a company, which is either a private company or a public one. And you've got these examples of demutualizations in financial services in particular, um, where that um, has taken place in some countries, you know, in, in a very big way. Um, the, the reason that people put forward for these demutualizations are normally, you know, around capital. Um, so we all know what the capital conundrum is in the cooperative, you know, which is, you know, how can you get investment into the business without risking demutualization? Um, and, you know, this is, you know, forever been seen as a, a, a weakness of cooperatives, which, you know, on the other hand, are building patient capital over a long period of time from the grassroots upwards. It takes a long time and they can't, when they get into complicated capital heavy markets, compete with businesses that can raise money quickly. So the argument about access to capital is that, well, you know, cooperatives and mutuals, they can't raise capital. So you have to demutualize them so that they can carry on their business um, in a different um, uh, corporate format. But the question really is, is, what are they actually carrying that business for and for whom? You know, once they've demutualized, you know, who, who do they firstly belong to? Uh, not the same people. And who do they serve? And, and what is the business purpose? Which is the crucial question, really, for me. Um, because if it's owned by investors, then its purpose is to build capital value for those investors. It's, it's, it's actually written into the law of most countries that that's the job of a company for, you know, to, to build capital value for its investors. And you can take the directors to court if they don't achieve that. Um, so it's no longer the same business. So to answer your question directly, you know, where's an example of where a cooperative or mutual has demutualized and it's ceased to serve its business? Well, it can't serve the same people because they're no longer the owners. They're no longer the stakeholders that the business exists for. So um, it's something else. It's a different type of entity. But then if we, if we look again at this argument about access to capital, um, and we can start to deconstruct it because in lots of ways, it's a false argument. Um, and loads of businesses say we need capital. For example, in financial services, oh, it's all become very technical. We need more money to um, invest in infrastructure, IT infrastructure, for example. And that's yeah. been used many times over as a justification for demutualizing. Of course, the demutualization happens, but what then happens to that business? It's no longer a mutual. It's a, um, a, a capital accumulating business. But actually, what about the capital? It doesn't actually stay independent. And you can look, you can count on one hand the businesses that get demutualized and stay independent because what happens is they get merged into other businesses rapidly. Um, Australia is a really good place of these examples. Um, I looked at it recently and you've got some very large demutualizations of financial services businesses, of um, uh, mutual um what were credit unions and building societies, um, uh, we might call mutual banks today. Um, many of those were demutualized. Um, insurance um, sector was completely obliterated um, uh, in Australia by demutualization with the, you know, the worst example of a lot, AMP, yeah. um, being a business that um, as soon as it had demutualized, um, it, it didn't raise capital to stay independent. It soon merged. Um, and then, you know, not very long later, um, uh, ceased um, to be able to function as, a, as, a, as a, a useful part of society. It was a, it was a problem for society, you know, with its um, uh, scandals of, of um, uh, mis-selling products. Um, and what you end up with in all of these demutualizations, and I'll come on to the best example of a lot in a second, is that they don't actually deliver what they were supposed to deliver in the first place. They don't deliver strong independent businesses. I can pick a couple of examples where that they did do that. I mean, one is Biggie Cheese in Australia, which demutualized and has stayed independent and has used the capital to build the business. <laughs> Ironically, to hoover up some other cooperatives in the, in the, in the, um, 
in the meantime. But actually, um, that's the exception that proves this rule because everybody else has merged in, become part of bigger banks. And if you look at the banking sector, which is now concentrated in Australia, in the UK, lots of these demutualized businesses have been merged into enormous monster organizations. And when they go wrong, they go wrong in a big way. And in Europe and America, we suffered the global financial crisis in a very bad way. And it was it was contributed to in a very significant way by businesses that had previously been independent that merged into these um, massive mega banks and then collapsed. And they had to be paid for by the taxpayer. Now, in contrast, the, ex the remaining cooperative and mutual sector didn't need bailing out, didn't need taxpayer support and carried on providing services um, according to its business purpose. Um, and so you can see it's not just about the individual members uh, losing out from demutualization, but you can see that society loses out from demutualization. It creates risk in economies and it makes life more difficult for governments. If only they would see that. If only, if only, and if only members had a better uh, understanding of what it was that they were giving up because many of the demutualizations that uh, I've seen happen have happened where the men members have a nominal share and they're told that their nominal share, and this certainly happened with bigger cheese, that their shares which ha held a nominal value were all of a sudden going to uh, have a market value which was going to be significantly more and um, and, you know, they were going to suddenly become very wealthy in the sense that what they held now was a, a share capital. Certainly, this is not the case for mutuals, as we know, and it's an interesting point of difference, isn't it, between co-ops and mutuals. But the big demutualizations that I've seen here recently had a lot to do with the members. Um, well, Murray Goulburn was very different than Bigger Cheese, I think. But Bigger Cheese was one of those demutualizations where, where the exiting members and it was a situation where a dairy industry was was declining in terms of the numbers of members that were there but growing in terms of the amount of capital that was required but it I guess inevitably what it did or what it did cause and, and probably not enough attention has been given to this is the loss of small dairy farms in this area because this is where I am right now I'm in Bega um, the loss of small dairy farms so that uh, uh, we now have mega just a few mega dairy farms. So we think about bigger cheese as the production and manufacturing industry, but it was also a dairy farming sector, which has all but disappeared. So diversity well, that, is something we're going to talk about shortly. Yeah. Well, that, that's a really interesting point. And um, there are all sorts of consequences for these, for these decisions, that, which people don't think about at the time, and they bemoan them afterwards. Um, but, you know, demutualization should be thought through very carefully before it's proposed. I think we can distinguish between um, co-ops and mutuals where there's been a capital contribution by the members and those where there hasn't. Um, and so you can see an argument, say, for example, in an agricultural cooperative, um, which has been established over generations and over generations, the generations of farmers have contributed capital to that business to make it what it is. Um, they've put money in it and they've taken risk um, in doing that and they've benefited from that risk. Um, in contrast, you look at some of the consumer um, mutuals in the credit union, the banking and the insurance sector. And the contribution has only ever really been nominal where a member would make a you know, one dollar or ten dollar um, uh, subscription. And that's what it is. It's a subscription for using the services. It's not a capital contribution. So if you pay back that money with interest, that's really what the member owns. They don't own the underlying assets and the whole concept of them. And, you know, not too far away from where you are. I mean, you've got Newcastle Permanent Building Society. It's got permanent in its name because the intention was that it would be exactly that. It wouldn't be... Um, taken apart and shared out at any point, you know, that asset was to be passed on to the next generation for their use and it would be inherited. And so the members ownership, and we sort of probably a little bit guilty of this in our sector of talking about ownership, but the idea of ownership needs to be distinguished in mutuals um, because 
we're not talking about the subdivision of everything by the number of members that you've got. Um, it, there is a, a, a an estate, an asset which belongs to past generations and future generations. And we're just the stewards for this to do the best we can whilst we're around um, with those assets. So, um, yeah, I, I can't see any justification for sharing out um, centuries of assets among people who haven't contributed to them. Um, and, you know, we saw in lots of countries, UK in particular, that people would join just before a deadline in order to be able to carpet bag um, yeah. some of those assets. So, you know, it's completely corrupt and yeah. should be outlawed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a lot, a lot about, I think, the movement or the sector having to fit, a, fit their business, you know, which is a square peg into a round hole in many ways. And that has... And that sort of brings us to a really interesting point, but I'm going to come back to it, which is about diversity, because the no brainer in all of this is diversity, isn't it? You know, we, we talk about diversity everywhere. Oh, we need diversity on boards. Or if you've got an investment portfolio, oh, you, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. You need diversity. Yet here we are talking about, um, you know, types of businesses across a sector and we don't have very much diversity. And as you say, particularly if they're amalgamating uh, merging vertically, then we're ending up with all our eggs in one basket. And we, we, we suffered from that through the GFC, but it seems like we haven't learned that mistake. So I'm going to come back to the question of diversity, but we're here to talk a little bit about um, the, the voters' rejection of the takeover bid by Bain Capital of LV. I'm not sure how, do you, do you just call it LV? Is that it's a... Just LV, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The equals is just, you know, some marketing. <laughs> a little bit of jazzy marketing. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I, I confess I didn't know about LV, but I'm in Australia and, and uh, you know, some people do know about LV because it's a great sport sponsor, sponsors cricket and so on, but I'm sure it's very well known in the UK. But it has received quite a lot of press in the, in the lead up to this uh, takeover bid. And we know that the members have voted uh, to reject the bid by uh, Bain Capital. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the organisation. I, I know it started out as a friendly society, um, but tell us a little bit about LV and what were the events in particular, probably more recent, that led up to this situation? Sure, yeah. Um, so... I mean, until recently, LV was the second biggest mutual insurer in the United Kingdom um, with 1.2 million members, um, with um, a whole suite of insurance products. Um, but what's happened in Europe recently is that um, the, the, the uncomplicated way of putting this is that the amount of capital that um, an insurance company has to um, be able to retain to cover its um, its commitments uh, has increased, um, and so this caused some difficulties for LV in its in its previous form. And it had been going for 178 years. It was um, originally a burial society where people put a penny into a box to try and avoid a pauper's funeral. Um, very working class. Um, uh, concept uh, started in Liverpool and then became a national business. And over years, it merged with other co other friendly societies and mutuals. It was a friendly society. Um, and then when the rules changed on capital adequacy, um, they found that they needed to raise money and they had a very successful um, general insurance business, um, which was um, car insurance, home insurance, that kind of thing. Um, and they decided to sell it. They sold it to uh, Allianz of Germany uh, for over a billion pounds. So you know, this is a very, very sweet deal, a very serious amount of money. Um, and that was um, something like twice the amount of money they needed for their capital adequacy. So it was, you know, it was, it was a good deal and it gave them the opportunity to look forward what we're going to do next? We're not going to do general insurance, or if we did, we'd have to start again. Um, so what we're going to do with the rest of the long term um, insurance business and the kind of products they would sell would be uh, with profits, um, policies, pensions, 
um, lifetime endowments, uh, long-term policies with people in for, you know, years, decades, rather than uh, just a year at a time. Um, after they sold Allianz to, um, uh, sold the general insurance to Allianz, uh, they changed the chairman uh, of the business. Not a big deal, not seen as, you know, too much of a, of a radical step. Um, the previous chair had reached the end of his tenure and it was time to get a new one. And they, they took on this uh, character, Alan Cook. Um, and um, under his chairmanship, um, they decided to convert the Friendly Society in 2019. And this is all quite important to the, to the sort of timeline of events um, to a company limited by guarantee. So it was still a mutual, but instead of coming under Friendly Society law, it would come under company law. Um, and the argument that was put forward for this was that friendly society legislation, no surprise here, hadn't been updated for donkey's years. And so let's go and become a company and have all the flexibilities that we'd have under the company's legislation still being a mutual. Um, this isn't a radical idea because the other two biggest mutuals in the UK are both companies um, with a mutual constitution. So it wasn't seen as, as, as too, too big a deal. But it declared, the company declared its commitment to mutuality at that time. But remember the date, May 2019. Within five months, the chief executive had um, been replaced with someone completely new from outside the sector um, who was unknown and um, was very much seen as a surprise appointment. And he started work on the 1st of January 2020. So here we are, May 2019, October 2019, the pandemic's raging around us, yeah? Um, uh, no, the pandemic's just about to start raging around us in, um, in the early part of 2020. And within 12 weeks of taking up the post, um, this new chief executive has completed a thorough strategic review and put the business up for sale. Only he didn't tell the members it was for sale. So by March 2020, LV is being touted around for sale around different financial services markets and purchases. And it was only in June of last year that this leaked to the media and the members found out through a Sky News report that the business that they owned the business that they were members of um, and had just been committed to mutuality a year before was up for sale and they'd had 12 bids. Within a very short space of time, by September, um, the board announced they were in sole discussions with Bain Capital. And this was seen as a bit of an earthquake because an American private equity investor um, had never been involved in UK um, life insurance before. Um, it was um, completely seen as out of the blue because for some years there'd been on-off discussions between LV and Royal London, which is the biggest mutual insurer in the UK. So the top two had been on-off discussions about merging. And everybody always assumed that if anything was going to happen to LV, it would merge with Royal London. Um, but Royal London was ruled out of the bidding um, at this point. And by... December of 2020, um, the board announced that they had agreed a sale price um, to Bain Capital, and that was the first time they wrote to their members to tell them anything about the whole deal. It's mind blowing. It is yeah. absolutely mind blowing, and all, all legal. Yeah, <laughs> entirely all legal. legal. Yeah. But interesting that the new CEO has done this. I wonder about, you know, had, had he bothered to have a look at the Constitution even because, you know, if he sold it without even talking to his members, even thinking about getting a mandate, do you think that he was completely oblivious to the concept of mutuality? Do you think he, he was aware of it or didn't know what it was? By his own admission, he had no experience of working uh, with a mutual before. Um, and he maintains to today 
that he had no preset agenda, that he was going to do the review and, you know, move forward on the review. But, I mean, it just doesn't stack up credibly. And that's one of the factors that became, you know, the big part of this whole story was that mm. they um, uh, had an incredible um, message to give to members, which was, you know, we're not going to tell you about all, all this stuff. We're just going to tell you what we've done. And then we're going to ask you to vote in favour of it. Um, but don't ask us questions about the justification for it, because we're not going to tell you and we're not going to share that information with you. And then, you know, over the whole period of about a year, you know, this sort of was dragged out of them. You know, bits of information were dragged out of them. I mean, fundamentally, it looks to any disinterested observer that this was um, planned by the chair, that the conversion to a company limited by guarantee was part of it, because mm. by going under company law, they get around a very important part of their constitution, which is the poison pill. So mm. if we now look at mutuals in many countries, certainly in Australia, um, they have high thresholds in their constitutions that if you're going to demutualize, you have to have three quarters vote in favor of it on a 50 percent turnout. That's typical. Yeah. In some places, yeah. it's even higher than that. Mm. That under friendly society law can't be changed in the UK. You can change the rule, but then you have to have the same threshold to change the rule. So it effectively stops demutualization occurring. Um, however, if you convert to a company, you can apply to a court for a scheme of arrangement to override the constitutional um, settlement. And that was the intention of LV. So they had planned, in fact, today is the, um, I don't want to date this interview, but today is the 20th of December. And today was the date set for the scheme of arrangement to be um, a, put before the High Court in London, um, had, the, had the vote gone through. And so it was always their intention that they would do this because there's no way they would ever meet the turnout threshold of 50% of members voting. And they knew this from the first day. So just to clarify, am I correct that because they were a company limited by guarantee, they still had to get a 75% majority, presumably because it was going to be a special resolution, but they didn't have to have a 50% membership turnout. Is that right? Well, no they, did, they did, but they could apply to the court to have it overruled. Right. So okay. the scheme of arrangement would have been to overrule their own 50% turnout. Yeah I, I, yeah, I read about that. I was just confused because they, did they get a 50% turnout in the member no. vote? No, it was no. 15 in the, in the end. It was a 15% turnout. And we'll come, you know, hopefully come on to talk about, you know, some of the yeah. lessons around that, that level of apathy uh, in yeah, all of yeah. them. Um, it, you know, it's almost like, you know, you had a, a, a sort of a, a, a mini war between a, a small number of members with everybody else sort of watching, eating popcorn. Um, <laughs> but actually, you know, it was quite, you know, fierce uh, for those who had um, skin in the game. Absolutely, absolutely. So that segues beautifully into to telling us a little bit about how Mutual and the Co-op Party UK became involved in this and what role did they play um, in, rallying, in, in you know, rallying the members um, so that there were at least some that were aware of what, what was going on. Okay, so um, I should just explain how um, the UK mutual sector um, works with Parliament first, because um, for some years, um, there's been an all party parliamentary group for mutuals. And this is a place where members of Parliament, members of the House of Lords can come together and discuss, hear about um, uh, aspects of importance in the mutual sector, discuss interesting aspects of that, um, and work together on specific areas of um, shared interest. So it's completely cross party. It has about, I think, 100 members um, of the um, uh, MPs and peers um, in Parliament. So it's quite a big parliamentary group um, and it meets four times a year. And for some years, Mutro has provided pro bono secretariat support for this. So we've, we've managed the meetings, we've 
um, arranged the programme and we've um, put, put, put this together. Mm. Um, when we saw that the deal had been um, agreed with Bain Capital, I mean, we were pretty horrified. Um, and we went to talk to the, um, the chair and the vice chair of the all party group and, and we said, we've got to do something about this. I mean, we were surprised that nobody else had done anything. Nobody had said anything yeah. about it even. Um, it was complete radio silence from the mutual sector, apart from the Association of Financial Mutuals, which is the peak body for um, mutual insurers, which had put out a pretty a pretty benign, um, you know, uh, press release. I think the expectation was there's nothing anybody could do about it. If they wanted to do this, that's the way it's going to be. And we looked at the timeline and we thought this is, you know, th this, this deserves a little bit more scrutiny. And so we suggested that the group... Um, conducted an inquiry into the proposed demutualization, a very quick one, because we didn't know how quickly they were going to bring forward the member vote. At the time, we thought it could be as soon as, um, as May this, this, this year. We thought it could be May. And that was certainly the intention. If you looked at the press releases from LV, they said they wanted to have the, the vote in the first half of 2021. So we knew we had to move quickly. So the group... Um, agreed to conduct a, a quick inquiry and they had six sessions uh, of calling evidence from different witnesses, um, from different cooperative and mutual businesses, from their business leaders uh, and from LV themselves. And so this um, was pulled together and a report was produced. We wrote the report and it was produced in April this year. Um, and, you know, you know, the, the evidence that we found was quite shocking. You know, the, you know, the circumstantial evidence of the timeline, the um, strange decision to keep the whole thing secret um, and the extraordinary conclusion that Bain Capital was the appropriate business to. And, and I think something that the press release had said from LV had said something like, you know they would they would be different owners but they would keep the same business purpose well this is extraordinary nonsense um so we, we didn't think that was 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 a good idea but the, the fundamental finding of the of, of the of the inquiry was that there's no way given the information that had so far come into the public domain that members would have a clue what was in their interests because they're only being fed very partial information very limited information and so that needed to be expanded upon. Um, I, I, yeah, I noticed that the Financial Market Conduct Authority had a, a role to play there. Um, certainly they were able to object, um, is that correct? And they, and they decided yeah. not to object. They said they, it was a non-objection. Um, I know their role is limited, but I think it's worth mentioning that they were effectively saying they were satisfied with the communications. Yeah, they, they did. did. And th this, this was extraordinary. You know, we, mm. we found it completely extraordinary. I mean, I think mm. the reality of the situation with the regulator was that they thought as well, this was just going to go through. Yeah. You know, no demutualization had ever been stopped before. They all went through. Yeah. So why would this be any different? You know, there might be some pesky people making a noise at the side, but it would still go through. Yeah. Um, and that was their expectation. And so I don't think they actually paid a lot of attention to it until okay. Parliament started to scrutinise it. And on the back of the inquiry, um, and there were a number of parliamentary debates and interventions, a series of very difficult questions, a flood of letters from members of Parliament to the regulators and the Treasury. And then suddenly the regulators started taking the whole thing a lot more seriously, but only to the degree that they they spent more time trying to justify their position. Yeah. Um, so this dragged it out for some months. Um, and we used those months um, working with the members of Parliament. I should mention Gareth Thomas as the chair, the indefatigable chair of the 
of the all party parliamentary group you know he he put so much time into yeah. into this campaign um and then we 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 went, we went looking for friends in the media who would agree with all of this and we couldn't find anybody who agreed with lv you know 100% of the of the media commentary was um calling this out as a terrible idea yeah um yeah. so we knew we, we, you know, we, we just had to keep pushing this. Um, but we also knew that there was going to be an offer of cash um, to vote for it um, and that nobody had ever succeeded before. So the, 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 this was all stacked against us. And by the way, the only information that members got about it directly was from LV themselves. So everything else they had to pick up from newspapers or from the television or the radio. Um, we got lucky with um, a Daily Mail campaign, um, and uh, it's sort of you know, it's got probably the biggest readership in in the UK. You know, whatever it stands for for other things. But I mean, if we put that aside, um, um, its financial and business pages are um, very well resourced, and um, they joined the campaign um, to try to get LV members to um, to oppose the deal because they didn't think it was in their interests. And we had an, an extra session of the all party group to get the chairman in front of it. Um, and, you know, again, you know, we, we, we finished with, with fewer, um, with more questions and answers at the end of that session. Um, and so we identified members um, organized the letter writing campaign, a petition to regulators. There were parliamentary debates, as I said. Um, and then we found lawyers to prepare a legal challenge because we believed that the information that had been provided to um, members was inadequate for them to make this decision. And so a court should not permit a scheme of arrangement, Should even if the vote went through, should not yeah. permit the scheme of arrangement to stand. Um, yeah. And we were supported by a city law firm, which gave pro bono, pro, pro bono support. Uh, we got a QC um, providing advice um, and uh, we prepared to, to challenge them in court had, had we not succeeded with the vote. So um, whew, what can I say? I mean, it was an enormous um, effort. Um, and uh, there's only two people full time in Mutro. <laughs> And the rest of us, uh, the rest of our network is, yeah. is, is sort of jobbing consultants. Um, yeah. So, you know, we probably spent, you know, a good half of our, of our work time this year um, uh, prosecuting this case. And then at the end, others joined in the campaign. So you asked about the Cart Party and um, the other trade associations. Um, they were quite late to the game, but they came in, you know, around about October time and that all added to the pressure. Um, yeah. And so, you know, by the time that the vote happened, um, all of the uh, commentary was um, uh, in favour of the, the arguments that we've been putting. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to to think about this and about the strategy that, that you've used, which really goes back to a bit of forward thinking about the role of the all party working group and just how important that is to have that political support across the party spectrum. And it's one thing that uh, co-ops and mutuals have been able to do quite often. And we've seen that happen in Australia as well, where you get that cross party support. And again, it, it seems to me that it comes back to educating, uh, you know, one of the really huge advantages in having those sorts of groups is that you're in the process, you're also educating those people about the value in the model and, and why it's different than a, an investor owned model. But it also tells us a little bit, doesn't it, that we've got this sort of on the one hand, uh, the involvement of parliament and some sort of uh, statutory implications, some regulatory um, protections even in the sense that you could have lodged a challenge uh, had the scheme of arrangement gone through to the courts. On the other hand, you've got this sort of general view, which seems to me to have been the, the, the lay down sort of 
approach that everybody else took, uh, which was, oh, this is inevitable. Once the demutualization is on the table, it will go through, which is sort of seems to me uh, what we're thinking about there is that the market, it's that, that, it, that sort of almost acceptance of the inevitability of the market. This is the, and this is the market and the market will do what it, you know, what, whatever it will. Um, but of course, that's not the case. Uh, you know, th th there is this interaction between the state and the market always there. And I just, I guess what I'm really interested in, and it's, it's underpinning my research work, is, is what, how can the role of the state change, the regulators change, to protect diversity, a corporate yeah. diversity? Do you think there needs to be some change in the way that things are done? Like, for example, the regulator here didn't do much. Um, I, I did notice that they said that they can't consider the nature of the ownership model in, in when they make a decision. They're not allowed to consider the nature of the ownership model. I wondered whether they should be required to consider the nature of the ownership model, for example. Well, I mean, if you go back to what I said earlier on, I mean, the reason we exist is to try to improve the business environment for co-ops and mutuals. And there are three main drivers in that, in the public realm, and they are regulation, legislation, and policy. But yeah. the most important by far of those three is policy, because policy includes the political will to do something. So, you know, to your point about education, you know, you, you have to have people involved in deciding policy who have a knowledge of what they're doing. I mean, it seems like a sort of no brainer thing to say, but actually who knows about co-ops and mutuals, you know, who know, who understands um, the difference, who understands capitalism. And, you know, that's a it's sort of a regular refrain of mine, you know, is we need to teach people about capitalism before we can teach people about cooperation because only then will they understand the difference. Yeah. And uh, this, this monoculture, this draining monoculture of, yeah. Um, economists, of educationalists, of lawyers, of politicians, that there's only one way of doing things is what we're challenging. So it's a massive task. It's enormous. In lots of ways, you know, we can, you know, pull off, you know, the occasional, um, you know, spectacular success. But overall, we're still losing on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, so going back to, you know, the, the responsibilities and all of this, yes, absolutely. The regulator should have responsibilities to, you know, to, to, to manage diversity because they're supposed to have responsibilities to manage risk in the economy. And if they can't see that one is connected with the other, then yeah. where are we going? Yeah. But let, let's, let's be clear about it. A regulator does what its mandate tells it to do. So if its mandate is not, firm enough, i.e. the legislation, the statute that sets up the regulator, then you've got to strengthen it. And so, again, to your point, it's absolutely critical that regulators have this responsibility, legal duty to ensure that diversity is not harmed by decisions like this. And then the question arises, how do you make that happen? And you only make it happen if you have the political will to make it happen. And you're only going to get that if you have educated and um, informed and supportive um, politicians. And so that's why, going right back to the beginning, it's absolutely crucial to have these kind of long-term relationships built up with parliamentarians who one time will be in opposition, the next time will be in government. Um, it's a long game. You have to completely repeat it constantly. You have to educate people. But if you don't do it, there's no point running to them when there's a crisis because there's no one to listen. Um, and in this situation, we had a superb labor and cooperative chair of the all party group, a superb mm -hmm. conservative vice chair and a superb liberal Democrat vice chair. And the three of them basically through most of the punches yeah. um, and did a great job, worked together across party because they all equally understood the importance of this because they were engaged in it. They were experts in it. And that's something that you have to do 
over a long period of time. So, you know, everybody around the world has to do this. I know lots of countries do it, but it's a really important part of, of that job. And then, you know, you're an educationalist, you know, you know, you, you will know how few people actually um, understand um, different types of ownership structure and different types of business purpose. But we've got this massive opportunity now, which I'm really optimistic about, which is the movement towards people understanding sustainable business and making purchasing decisions and investment decisions based on that sustainability. And there's nothing more sustainable than the cooperative. So if you have the correct organization in the co-op, if you have the correct um, communication in the co-op, then you've got a real opportunity to take advantage of all of that. And the pennies will drop all around, you know, with, with the politicians, with the educationalists, with the lawyers and everybody else. They'll say, oh, that's what you mean. <laughs> yeah, we're not actually talking just about a, 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 a legal structure. We're talking about a business purpose. Yes. And we're different. It's a cooperative business purpose. And if you can like that and enjoy um, supporting that, then you need to make sure that the legislative, regulatory and policy framework makes it happen, makes the environment work. I think that th this is a great, we're entering a very optimistic period, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. I can, you can sort of smell or sense the change in the wind in terms of, you know, and, and, and it does come from policy, doesn't it, that all of a sudden they're starting to sit up and take notice about the need to look at sustainability because, as you say, the capitalist model has devastated the earth in a sense. You know, we're really looking down the barrel of, of so much destruction and it continues um, like this rolling, you know, machine that's just exploiting and extracting and exploiting and extracting and to exploit and extract, it's looking at, you know, limitless growth. Uh, so... It's interesting, I've said this to a few people, it's really interesting now that we sort of have been through a couple of years of pandemic, how the states have had to look inwards again for a while, which is something that they haven't um, been able, well, that they haven't focused their attention back inwards. And when they were looking outwards, it, there was this sort of, sort of nimbyism, wasn't it? Not in my backyard. Um, let's get rid of filthy manufacturing. Somebody else can take care of that problem. Um, and now all of a sudden they're going, manufacturing, we can't import anything, nothing's available, you know, like, oh, gee, maybe we need some manufacturing industries. And um, it's an interesting time um, when you think about that together with sustainable business that we can all of a sudden say that, hey, yeah, and I loved you, you've almost given us a byline that there's nothing more sustainable. There's no more sustainable business model than the cooperative model. That's right. And it's about getting people to understand what we mean by that sustainability. Yeah. And it's about a different business purpose. And to me, that's, you know, everything that, that, that encapsulates why we do what we do. And um, that's why it was worth fighting. You know, we were fighting for that. We we're fighting for the business purpose. We weren't just trying to stop Bain Capital. Although, to be fair, I mean... I think if they'd succeeded, the next thing they'd be doing be looking for other victims. Um, and you know, what 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 do they do? I mean, you can't blame them for doing what they do. That's what yeah. they do. Yeah, you know? that's their business. That's their business yeah. purpose. It's that's to... exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So we understand <laughs> that. So yeah, yeah. it's not yeah, being any doubt. True. They're not going to be um, our, our sugar daddies anyway. Hey, that reminds me, sorry, that just reminded me of in Australia, you might be aware we had a banking royal commission a while ago and revealed the terrible behaviour of some of the banks. And, and, and it was just fascinating. I remember a fellow cooperator and I were talking about this where, where the, the, uh, the commissioner was saying it's just terrible because they're, they're not looking after their customers. <laughs> They were looking only looking after their investors and say so how terrible that was. And we were like, yeah, but that's the business model. Yeah. <laughs> they're just yeah. doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is the business model. So and that's right. And that's when I say I don't think people understand capitalism, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah that's what they do. <laughs> you know, don't be surprised if they do that, you know. And if they yeah. cut corners and they 
you know, try and find ways of doing more for their uh, investors because that's where they get their incentives from and that's how they get paid. Absolutely. But they're going to do it, yeah. you know. So, yeah, we shouldn't be naive about that. Mm. Unfortunately, I think there is too much naivety about, about exactly that. And I think that's probably a segue into the, the, the second part of this question. We've talked about how you were able to, to get that support, that really important support from the politicians and how, what a difference that made. But what about the member base? Because we've only had, a, LV only had a very small turnout and, whew, you know, it, it uh, it's a bit scary when you think about it. Um, but 85% of the members of LV didn't turn out to vote. I'm not that surprised, I think, in, for a, a customer-owned business model. That Again, there is this general apathy, which is a bit like the new CEO uh, thinking, well, we don't have to tell you about this, that he was essentially treating them like they were the members of an investor-owned organisation where essentially... Member, members showing up to vote at, at a general meeting, it, it, they're not factored in. It's considered that only a very small proportion of members will be, and then they rail against shareholder activism, don't they, if there is any. Yeah. Um, so so what, do we, what do we think about this, this issue? You know, you're a mutual, you're a member-owned business, and, and yet most people don't vote. They don't exercise that democratic right, which is such an important feature, core feature of the mutuals is the one member, one vote. Um, so, so what can mutuals do, do you think? How, how can mutuals change this? Is, is, are there things that they, they're not doing well that they could do better? Well, firstly, on the numbers of this, um, of this demutualisation vote, 85% um, of members didn't vote, 15% did. Normally, in their in their annual meetings, they would or their um, special meetings, they would get nine percent. So they had an increase of fifty percent in turnout yeah, <laughs> on this yeah. on this vote. Um, yeah. But it's still small numbers. Um, but you can see from these small numbers that um, you can crunch them in different ways. And one of the ways you could crunch them is that if they had if they had even reached the seventy five percent on the fifteen percent turnout it would have been something like 10% of the total qualifying membership. That, and you, you can't make a decision to demutualize a business on that basis. That's why we have super majorities built into um, constitutions. And that's why they need to be maintained. And that's why, you know, we should not permit um, those super majorities to be undermined by uh, some clever legal uh, ruse, which is what was proposed here. But anyway, come back to your question. I think there's a few lessons from this which are um, separate from the legislative and the regulatory shortcomings. I mean, the first one is, is, is a positive message, which is that demutualization, it can be opposed successfully. It's not inevitable. And so, you know, the, the, I can't count the number of people in the last week who've spoken to me and said, oh, we never thought that would happen. Oh, we never thought that would you know what? In the last two weeks, I did think it would happen. Yeah. I did think we could do this because I still hadn't come across a single person who wasn't paid for by LV who thought it was a good idea. Mm. So, you know, of all the people who were offered cash to vote for this, um, not enough of them wanted to do it. And I think that's, you know at least a small victory. But moving on to the sort of, you know, the sort of failure of engagement in all of that, um, I think the first thing to say is that mutuality, in my experience anyway, only really works where there's good faith and trust. And that's built up over time. It's built up through communications. It's built up through engagement with uh, members. And if you look at the businesses that have demutualized, they're the ones that haven't done that. They're the ones that haven't engaged, that haven't um, kept that communication going. And so I think, you know, there is a correlation there between those. So lesson, the big lesson in all of that, lesson number two, is that there has to be um, good faith and trust. And it's a two-way process that's built up over a long period of time. And when you get a leadership, 
And I'm not just picking a, picking on the chairman here, who is, you know, the, the villain of the piece. Um, but the board supported him all the way through. You know, all of them. They're all responsible for this clear. If Even if they think they were right, it was an error of judgment because they didn't get the votes. So um, I don't think that they've operated in the interests of the members. And they're certainly not communicated and participated with the members at any point. Actually, I should have mentioned that one of the uh, scandalous things that happened in 2020 was that during um, one of the lulls in COVID in the UK, when people were actually moving around, there wasn't a lockdown. Um, in September 2020, they had their AGM, but they decided not to make it online and to have just 12 people in the room. 12 people, 1.2 million members. And the only way they could qualify on their quorum was to drag two staff members in who were qualifying members to meet the quorum. The whole thing was over in eight minutes. Now, that was the same week that they decided to make Bain Capital the exclusive negotiator. And so you've got to ask questions about their good faith in all of that. You've got to ask questions about that. But more to the point, um, and what can we all, the rest of us, learn from all of this is, is that mutuals need to constantly demonstrate their member value and their engagement. Um, they've got to do it on a commercial basis. They've got to do it on a moral basis. You know, what's the point? What is membership all about? And what is the value of all of that? Because members will fiercely protect their membership when they know what it's worth. But if they're disengaged, if they're not communicated with, if the whole thing looks just like any other public limited company, then they're just going to treat it like that. So actually, you're you know, from Australia, you know, the BCCM's fabulous um, mutual value measurement um, tool is a really good way of identifying, helping getting the story, getting the narrative, you mm. know, around, you know, what the difference of value is in, in, in a a cooperative or mutual business, and then applying that um, to um, the way that the business operates, the way it describes itself, the way it communicates with it. People, when they know about this, will fight for it. And the people that we met who were fighting for the future of LV were absolutely relentless. And, you know, hats off to them. The members were great. Yeah, it really does come back to governance in a way, doesn't it? Because this is something that I picked up in some of my research. And it's a bit of a problem when in a competitive environment, co-ops and mutuals have had to grow to compete. So, so you know, once the, the, their competitors are getting bigger, they, they also feel like they've got to get bigger. So you have these amalgamations. But one of the things that I came across, and I thought it was really interesting, that as these organisations get bigger, their member, see, co-ops often have mainly members on the board, but they start to feel a bit inadequate and they feel like they need some external help and consultancy because of the complexity of their business models. The danger is always that those people will come in and they don't know anything about the model at all. So they've come in from the, the corporate sector. Well, one of the things that I came across was that a sense that particularly on boards, you know, when the board's when you're a board of an organisation that's starting, that's quite big and powerful, there is this sense, and I just say I think it's a little gendered, that they might uh, be not big boys. They're not playing at the big end of town so that, that uh, they feel the need to shed this, you know, sissy co-op uh, mm -hmm. outfit or whatever uh, so that they, that they are actually recognised as big boys in town. And, and I've come across this and I find, and I, I just wonder to what extent that sort of narrative underpins what happened with LV because you've, you've got a new a chairman that's, that seems quite determined to get rid of uh, mutuality. And, and I did notice somewhere in a press release where the CEO said, this is a model that does no longer suits this business. You know, it's, it doesn't fit us anymore. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I wondered if you, what you thought about that, because then I think you're right, I, because I think the solution to that does come down to, um, to mutual value measurement. Like the, the, the problem is if they've been told to measure their business value using indicators that don't rec 
recognise or reflect the business purpose, then they're going to see that their measure of success is different, actually. Um, so their measure of success is that they're, you know, recognised by the big boys down at the end of town and, and they're measured on some sort of financial efficiency. Um, whereas mutual value measurement is starting to bring in these other things which might reflect the business purpose. And that seems to be more important because, as you're saying, if they get that right, if the governance, if the people who are in power understand the model, then they will communicate it well to their members, then their members will understand it and have something to fight for. Yeah, I think that's all, all correct. I mean, at the end of the day, um, there was a lot of suspicion about self-interest uh, from the chair and the chief executive. Um, I mean, the one thing can be clear is that we couldn't work out who would benefit as a member from this, but we knew that the chief executive and the chair would both benefit um, financially from the deal because they'd get a new job out of it. And um, you know, they weren't hiding this, they admitted it, um, but surely that ought to have made them inappropriate people to be doing the negotiations with Bain. Um, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. if we put that aside and you think about the sort of you know, structural part of all of this, um, I think you're right about this um, attitude that somehow, you know, a mutual isn't as good as um, a listed company. Um, having said that, the fees paid to directors um, and to the chair were just as good as a comparable size um, listed company. So they weren't um, uh, holding back on, on, on that score. Um, I think the problem really here was that the case wasn't ever made for the deal. Um, the board didn't trouble itself with wanting to explain. You know, there's still a slight possibility that there's a, log a logic to this, but nobody ever found out what it was. Hmm. I mean, they said they needed capital, um, so they sold the business, the general insurance, for £1 billion. And then they boasted straight afterwards they were the best capitalised mutual in the UK. They were actually the best capitalised insurer in the UK at that point. Um, but then, just a few weeks later, they said they didn't have enough capital um, because they didn't intend to use that money, um, which was effectively the working capital of the business. And they needed another £100 million for IT and all sorts of things. And you had to drag the number out of them. They weren't going to say how much they needed. Um, but in reality, it was the board not wanting to invest in mutuality, it didn't believe in itself. Um, and probably for all sorts of reasons, uh, that, had, that had been you know, coming for a few years, not just because of the chairman. You know, they didn't have people on the board who could make that case. Um, ironically, in the end, they spent £43 million of members' money on this failed sale, which is half of what they said they needed. So you've got to scratch your head and think, you know, you know, maybe they needed somebody with a calculator to start off with to be able to, you know, work this all out because members never got to the bottom of the capital issue. Um, I, you know, I, I think that there are all sorts of questions around governance. I mean, I don't think that mutuals are any different from any corporate. You get failures of governance at every level all different types. I don't think there's any difference. And you can go through the same, you know, search processes to find direct non-executive directors for a mutual or for a non-mutual, and they'll have the same faults and the same successes. Um, however, um, the problem I think arises when you have no representation of membership, no, no, no consumer voice, no, no member owner voice in this situation. Um, and um, there was a member panel in LV, but it was toothless. It didn't really have any responsibility. So I think that, you know, the sort of the, the new world cooperatives and mutuals, certainly in Anglo jurisdictions. And I sort of apologise to the audience if anyone's listening from a, a, a country that this couldn't happen in because, you know, you, you're lucky. But it's because you've, you've got the legislation and the regulatory framework that wouldn't permit this. Lots of countries around the world don't permit this kind of asset stripping because they understand the value of mutual ownership and they understand the value of, um, of indivisible reserves and of um, capital which belongs to 
the estate rather than to individuals. So I apologise to them for having to listen to all of this. They might probably be sitting back thinking, well, it could never happen here. And it couldn't in lots of countries. Um, but in Anglo jurisdictions, you know, we probably need either to have new legislation which makes it as good as they have in France, Portugal, Argentina and other countries, you know, too numerous to mention. Um, or we need to have an Anglo version of governance, which makes sure that there is a voice for the member. And so it's not all done on an proxy basis on, on their behalf, that there is a voice, maybe a supervisory board, maybe a two tier structure, something like that. Maybe some control over who the chair is, the appointments of the chair. Um, and, you know, Mutual has done work on this um, for different new mutuals over the last 20 years in the UK. And it's been very successful in every case they've established when they've started from scratch, two tier structures. So you do have this, this, um, this, this real um, relationship between the membership and the governance of the, of the business. That's another subject area, but I mean, it does show that, you know, you're going back to the point I made before, you've really got to have good faith and you've got to have people wanting to make a success of the mutuality for it to succeed. Otherwise, you know, it can fall apart so quickly. What, what do you say about the idea that, that uh, directors should be asked to report on, on the achieving of their purpose in the year? So, so that they actually, in their annual report to their members, they have to tell their members what they've done to not just preserve their mutual structure, structure but to promote it in a sense, like almost to be audited on that, that particular point? That would yeah, be worthwhile. It's a really worthwhile idea because, mm. and you find this, I mean, if you read, read the annual reports of the best co-ops and mutuals, they do that already. You know, they talk about why they're different. They talk about what they do um, to be different and what they've achieved on behalf of their members. They're really good at it. And there's loads of really good examples in Australia. You know, you've got Australian Unity's fabulous example of that. Um, in the UK, um, the cooperative group, fabulous example of that. Van City in, uh, you know, in, in, in Canada, um, all, all over the world, you know, there's loads of really good examples. I'm going to stop giving examples because people say, what about us? Um, but I mean, there's loads of examples of really good cups and mutuals that do that very well. Um, formalizing in some way makes sense. One of the reasons I'm sort of quite pro-formalising is, is then inevitably those chairs and, uh, and, and CEOs as well have to have some understanding then of what it is that they're, you know, what, what, what the difference is. Why, why should they be uh, explaining to their members what a mutual is? They, they need to understand what it is before, if, if they're required by law to do that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, I think probably we've stretched our audience in terms of the listening time. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for taking time and it must be getting late where you are. It's, um, it's, it's a reasonable time of day here now. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation and, and I have learned so much. So, so I'm really lucky to, to get to sit in the interviewer's chair because I get to learn uh, so much from the people that I interview and uh, you're certainly no exception Peter it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you and your wisdom um, and we're yeah very fortunate um, to have had you explain to us what's happened here because it has such it has broader significance than just the situation with LV I guess to finish the one thing that we haven't sort of talked about is what next for LV so maybe we could just finish up on on that note yeah, well, I mean, you know, likewise, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you. And, uh, you know, you probably didn't expect me to go on for so long, but I mean, um, the future, um, they're either going to be an independent mutual business and there are smaller independent mutual businesses that are just, you know, successful. You know, the size is not um, a barrier to them. They're still well capitalised, as I said. Um, so, you know, they could with the right motivation um, potentially do that. They've also immediately had an offer of merger from Royal London, which has also offered um, uh, mutual membership to all of the existing uh, members of LV. So that's something that might be attractive to the members. Um, you know, I think 
We're going to see where the dust settles over the next few weeks. Um, and the All Party Group will be coming back to this in um, late January to, 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 to review uh, the situation. Um, but the members have spoken. And I think that's you know, the most important um, part of this story, which is that um, what was put in place by the members has been preserved by the members. Um, and you know, this business, for, for whatever it does, you know, it will be mutual going forward. And that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to wish you a very happy Christmas and New Year. We're just uh, in the rundown uh, to the festive season, which in Australia is the beginning of our holiday season. So um, I hope that you have a safe and happy Christmas. And thanks so much. Um, you too. You time. too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Nice to talk.